I'm not Joe McLean. Joe is probably having a caucus today in Scotland. They uh, are on a two week trip, and then uh, another member of our board is in Ireland. So that's why I'm here representing them. We are very fortunate as a society to have. About 85 corporate You're doing the presentation it's right. Something I'm still I'll give you a second mic for the video. our first chairman of our corporate membership drive. And it's continued to grow, Billy, and we could not do without it. It's the reason why your dues are the lowest historical uh, society dues in the state of Georgia. And today, I want to recognize uh, the corporate members that are with us. So many of these people are professionals, et cetera, and they can't take off and come, but today we have lots of members from Morris Bank. Would you please stand where you are and hold your applause. We're going to do this at the end and keep standing. <laughs> Hi, John. Uh, we have Ed and Bill Law. We have several members of the States World Columbus Club. I know you do. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. So, several of us in this room wear multiple hats, how we Trish? Um, the Hubie Law Firm, the Averitt Center for the Arts, We've got two board members plus me, uh, the States World Publishing Company. Henley Properties, I know Laura and Way are with us, and Cecil Howard of Howard Lumber Company. Let's give these fine folks and our, our friends in the community, and you know, these people are, are, are the people that not only support Willow County Historical Society, but they're, they're the reason why we love being a bulletin. Today, our speaker is no, uh, no stranger to our society at all. He did a program for us a few years ago. At that time, I was incarcerated. Yes, I was incarcerated in a wheelchair and could not leave the farm, so I missed it, Joseph. So you got to do double, double duty today. But I understood it was one of the best programs we've ever had. I know for a fact that he's an excellent writer and a storyteller because I follow him daily. I'm one of your stalkers. Joseph Sumner was born in Wrightsville, Georgia. His hobbies include anything outdoors. He's truly a Renaissance man from what I can tell. He enjoys hunting and fishing and traveling as well as writing and painting and carving. He also, this is something I'm very interested in, he builds metal sculptures from scrap iron. And I want to know, do you know Willie Tarver? I've heard of him. Okay, we got to talk. <laughs> I have some of Willie's collection. Willie's no longer with us, but he was the state folk artist for years and just a fabulous artist. We love folk art. Uh, Joseph is also an avid timberland farmer. He cruises timber, and then I think he buys the land, is what I think. He is a master at finding Native American artifacts and studying the indigenous people of Georgia and also the southeastern United States. Bill and I were just out west, and I bought this necklace from the Navajo. Certainly they're not our Mississippian and Woodland and Arcade, but you're going to talk about, but they were indigenous people. Joseph graduated from the prestigious Brentwood School in Sandersville, and he received degrees in finance and economics from Mercer University. After obtaining his credentials as a stockbroker, he returned to Mercer and graduated from the Walter F. George School of Law in 2003. There, he became lifelong friends with my lifelong friend and corporate member, Sherry Edenfield. Joseph has practiced law for 19 years. I can't believe that. I can't either. He said he can't either. He is the solo practitioner 
uh, of his firm, which he does general practice law in Dublin, Georgia. He also serves in many leadership positions with the State Bar of Georgia. We're very lucky to have him today. Please join me in giving Joseph Sumner a warm bulletin welcome. Right. Well, that was mighty nice. Um, you, most of that is true. <laughs> um, I want to thank you all for having me and um, back again. Um, I will, as she said, I'm going to talk more about the the uh, Indian artifacts of Georgia and kind of do a little bit more detail this time. Hopefully, um, can everyone hear me? Okay. As far as my background and how I got to doing this kind of thing and, and, and developed an interest in it, I had a grandmother who had six children and she has told me, uh, she told me when we were growing up that she needed something to do with all of them and my grandfather bought her a Jeep and they started going out and looking for artifacts to give them something to do during the summer times. And when I came along, she took me along with them and we would spend days out in these fields looking for uh, farm fields that had been plowed up. My other side of the family, my grandfather was a sawmill man and, and had timberland in Johnson and Washington counties and some in Trutland. And we, he always taught me, and, and I can hear him to this day, and my father's the same way, that whenever you cut a track of land, you've got to replant it. And you, the most important thing you do is, is replanting the land uh, to make that asset productive. And so that means you go out there with bulldozers and scalp it and replant it. And one of their tactics or one of their uh, beliefs is you always check on the planters and make sure the pine trees are planted right. So now I'm an adult and here I am doing what they did years ago. And you walk behind these bulldozers where there's been an earth disturbance and I started finding artifacts on certain sites. And I really had kind of put that aside um, until we bought a track up on the Oconee River. That hobby and interest of mine had kind of been dormant for a while. We bought this site that is right across a creek from what's known as the Shinholster Mound site. And it's a big double mound Mississippian site. And I'll get into this in more detail later, but it's probably where Hernando de Soto crossed. And we went in there, we planted it um, with, on this track was longleaf pine and um, really sandy, loamy soil. And as I started to walk, there was so many artifacts that and most of it was pottery. It, I just quit picking up the artifacts and I started to, I figured there's got to be something special about this track and that's what really got me back into it. Um, and, and that's been years ago now, but, but that is my background and I think if there's a takeaway from that, if you have kids or grandkids, it, you wouldn't be hearing from me today if my grandparents and parents didn't sort of facilitate me in, in building this interest and, uh, and, and so that's you know, literally why I'm, I'm here. Is because they spent time with me. So I'm going to go through the periods of Georgia, um, the, the prehistory of Georgia, and talk about the classes of artifacts, the cultures, and maybe dispel some, some myths along the way. The first artifact that a lot of people hear about are the Clovis culture, Clovis points. And they're distinct because all of them have this kind of what's called a blood groove. These are big spear points. They were brought, um, well, the, the technology probably came from somewhere in Europe, maybe the Iberian Peninsula. These were the Ice Age hunters. The land, there's plenty of, of artifacts that are similar to this. A lot of Clovis points that have been found in Georgia, but they're extremely rare. When you think about the way that everything looks today in our climate, understand that when you had, would have been uh, in this era, 13,500 years ago, it would have been a di very different land. Uh, you would have had, they would have been chasing and pursuing large groups of megafauna, such as the Mast mastodon and the giant sloth. Um, and that's what these, these were big, heavy, close quartered ambush spear points meant to take down big game. This was a dangerous pursuit. Um, the animal, this is a mastodon and it's a relative of the elephant. And that, that animal would have been, you know, there you can see the man standing by it. Imagine taking that on with a Clovis point. Um, 
very likely it wasn't a one shot, one kill, it was a wound and follow, high rate of mortality, a very dangerous way to live. The theory that everyone has been taught is that the peopling of the Americas occurred through, across the Bering Strait from the area known as Beringia during the last glacial maximum, which probably happened after 14,000 years ago when the seas got cold enough to freeze and then overcome groups of these, these uh, nomadic big game hunters from Asia. And it existed for a very small window of time because right now you know the Bering Strait is a sea, or the Bering Sea. Um, that has been what everybody has taught in, in textbooks is still that way to this day. Now, there's some sites, and I will be willing to, to bet you that, and some of this I think is almost accepted now, but you're going to find, and people, and archaeologists, and people way smarter than me are, are eventually going to admit, I suppose, that the first people in the Americas did not come across the Bering Strait Ice Bridge. I believe that they probably migrated by the, it's called the Salutrian Raft Theory. In that age, the polar ice caps were much larger, and I think that, that a lot of people have concluded, and there's evidence to suggest that this is so, that they migrated along these lower polar ice sheets from the Iberian Peninsula of Spain and probably landed on the east coast of Georgia and other places, not just Georgia, but uh, this is one site. This is the Paige Ladson site in Florida. And it's really an interesting situation or, or site in that this is a mastodon. A, there was a tusk. This is a, a bone. It's not the tusk, but this is a diver at that site. They found a mastodon tusk underneath a layer that was associated with 14,000 plus year old stuff, sediment that carbon dates and it's locked in that layer. So to the average person, if you don't think about that deeply, that didn't tell you a whole lot. But if you think about it a little closely, a little more closely, it tells you a whole lot because that tusk is below the Clovis layer. Somebody was there before the Clovis people could ever have come across the Bering Strait ice bridge. And, and you do have, you cannot carbon date stone, but you can carbon date a bone and, and a mammoth tusk. And that particular mammoth tusk, if you, if you Google this site, Paige Ladson, you can see pictures of the tusk, and not only is the tusk there, it has signs of butchering by a crude stone tool where the whoever killed it was extracting the bone marrow. Um, so I would encourage you to read more about it if you're, interesting, if you're interested in more and learning about the peopling of the Americas. The other site that's much closer to us and even more interesting to me is the Topper site. And so what you will find a lot in what I've done, what I don't do a lot of digging, I have done some digging. Most of what I've found has been through surface finds. Um, I don't go dig in a site that I know is an important archeological site. I, I will you know, poke around a little bit. If, I, if a dozer pushes up a berm of dirt, I'll scratch away in it kind of like a yard dog and see what's in it. But, but if you were gonna dig it, this is what an archeologist would look at. You got, this is your plow zone. This is where ag harrows would hit. Underneath that, you're gonna have more historic, and each site would be different, but this just kind of gives you an idea of the layering. This would be your earliest layer, this would be your, your base layer, or your uh, oldest layer, and then you're gonna have base of excavation. And that would be what a lot of people call sterile dirt. Once you get to sterile dirt, the conventional wisdom, well, it, if it's truly sterile dirt, there's, there's nothing underneath that, that layer. In my area of the country, it's hard red clay. I don't know, y'all probably have some red clay down here, but it's a little bit more loamy. But in, in my area where most of our land is located, if you hit that hard red clay, I mean, it, it, it's impenetrable. Um, you're gonna find most of your artifacts sitting on top of that. All right, now, with the topper site, the importance of the topper site, there was an archeologist from South Carolina named Al Goodyear, and the topper site is directly across the Savannah River from uh, Burke County. And so he was there and he was a subscriber to the Clovis, thir Clovis, Clovis First theory. And they got to the bottom, and this is the site. Um, he got to the bottom and he decided that it would be a good idea to go ahead and dig past that Clovis horizon and, go, and just confirm there's nothing below that. Because if there's nothing below it, the Clovis people are first, end of story. When he excavated underneath it, he found the remains of a pre-Clovis hearth 
And this is him. I don't know if you can see it in the picture, but that's Al Goodyear. This is the Clovis layer. This is a pre-Clovis layer. And this is what is believed to be a 50,000 year old hearth. And when they excavated it, it had five seats in the bottom and it had dispersions of flint chips out in front of where these five people were sitting. If you know how artifacts are made and Indian uh, uh, projectile points are made, they, they chip them, they nap away at them. And literally what it was, it's, it's the, this dispersion of flint and, or chert rock that spun off in front of this piece of ground that's underneath a Clovis layer. And there's, they can tell you there's no, there's no uh, sedimentary tricks that were played. There was no uh, cuts in the dirt. This was intact uh, earth when they excavated it. And that is a very, very big problem for Clovis, per Clovis first. I would encourage you to read about that site too. That is, there's a, a artifact that they found, they call it the topper chopper. And it's not a projectile point, but it's, a, it's almost a knife-like chopping tool. And it's unquestionably pre-Clovis. So the implication is we might have a pre-Clovis, one of the hottest pre-Clovis sites in the world sitting right here, very close to us to the east. Okay, this is a distribution of Paleolithic points from Georgia. Um, these are Clovis, these are Dalton, these are earlier points. Clovis is being the earliest, Dalton being right after Clovis. And you look at Burke County here, Burke County has 42 Clovis points on 101 Daltons. And, it, and it, it thins, that pattern thins as it goes west. And you would think, and I don't know that that's necessarily telling, but it is it's interesting, it's an interesting thought to think, why does the distribution thin as it goes west? It should thin as it goes east if the people came from the west. And the Clovis point itself was, uh, the Clovis name comes from a, a, a points that were found in Clovis, New Mexico. And so, you know, a lot of this became textbook material because I think that the scientists at that time just said that makes perfect sense. Here's the Bering Strait Ice Bridge. Surely they had to come from that, from, from that way and they didn't think about the other possibilities. But, you know, it's ironic that Clovis, New Mexico is what it was named after. And here you have a one of the hottest Clovis manufacturing facilities in the 13,500s right here across the Savannah River. These are some examples of Paleolithic points. Um, they were fine, fine craftsmen. Um, it took tons of time to do this and the level of skill. Modern flint knappers who practice untold hours still have a hard time mimicking these things. They, it can be done. These are more some of these are bowl and bevels. This is a transitional. These up here are, are uh, bowl and bevel points. These are early archaic points. And so that's after the end of the Clovis period. Now, something that people kind of assume is when they find uh, artifacts and people, everybody, a lot of people have done it. They go into a farm field and they find stuff and they all think it's, it's um, from the same group. And a lot of times it is, sometimes it is, but most of the time I think it's not. And I show this just to show this, this all actually did come from the same site. This is Mississippian pottery. So this is from around, this is a shard, and this would be around the time of Spanish contact. And these would be about 8,000 year old pieces, all from the same site. So that goes to show you a good site, you know, will have occupation for a long period of time. This is another one, and this is this frame right here. This piece, that's Mississippian, probably a, a Lamar period um, pottery design. And then you also have right here, this is an edge fill scraper, and that's 8,500 8, to 10,000 years old. That's another edge field, edge field. So you've got 10,000 years old to maybe 1415 AD, same site. How are many sites found? This is how I found a lot of them, just by accident. And these are the bulldozers. We walk behind them. This is a tree planter, and it's pulling this scalping device. Um, and he's putting down trees as he goes, you know, 
drives the row out, and I'll walk behind that, and a lot of times, most of the time, I find nothing, but sometimes you start walking into this field of, of chips and pottery and everything else, and you realize that you are on probably a Native American site. Now, why are certain sites more, in, more uh, heavily, um, or, or how, why were they more heavily occupied? Why were they occupied at all? Location, and, and location is really everything when it comes to um, Indian Native American sites. This is the piece of land that we bought that um, got me back interested in it right here. This, this is the track we bought. Um, this is the Oconee River, that's Town Creek, and these are the fields that we planted in Longleaf. All right, across that, right over here, is the Shinholster Mound site. And there's, you can't see it from these pictures, but there's a huge platform mound. Right there, you can see a node of pine trees, and everything else around it is hardwood. And here's what Topography can tell you a lot about a site. Um, you can find sites, I think, just based on topography. So, and I hope you can see this, but this is the same, this is a topographical map of this tract of land. And what happened is, this is a dead river. It was a dead river. And this is now called, has historically been called Indian Island. And it's called Indian Island because it's a major Mississippian mound site and it's a fortress in the swamp. It's surrounded on all sides by deep hardwood swamp, and you've got this high ground right in the middle of it, and so lo and behold, they decided that'd be a great place to put Indian mounds. The mounds there started around, I think 900 AD, went through another phase in 1200, and then they came to their greatest uh, incarnation just before Spanish contact. But, you know, compare those two pictures. If you were looking at a map here, you might not see a whole lot. Here, you see a whole lot. And again, if you have a site that you suspect to be uh, an Indian site, topography can be a good way to cut, cut right to it and figure out what you're dealing with. A defensible site is valuable in any age, especially with Indians and liquor steel operators. I can tell you I have found more old liquor stills and some of them that have not been so far abandoned on some remote property, and that site was one of them. And you know, the Indians were there because they were protected, and the moonshiners made liquor there because they were protected too. Um, and that's a steel that you can see the revenue or ax marks where they, they found the steel and cut holes in it. My grandmother made friends with the old man that used to own this place, and he was a notorious bootlegger. And he lost his, uh, he had an old truck that they, the county took from him because he didn't pay taxes on it because he didn't believe in paying taxes. They sold it at the courthouse square and she bought it and gave it back to him. And they became lifelong friends and she, she had the run of all that place area back in there. And um, he could tell her where everything was located. The major cultural periods, other than pre-Clovis, are you have archaic, woodland, Mississippian. You know, people say, people think about tribes. There were no tribes. There was no written language. There were no teepees. There were no uh, written language. Uh, Creek and Cherokee, everybody says, I've got a piece of land that was a creek, uh, there's a creek tribe living there, there's a, you know, the creek Indians used to live there. You might, but if you do, you're not gonna find many artifacts. Almost all of your artifacts, the creeks are of the historic period. The Mississippians were the last of the prehistoric people. Creek and Cherokee, uh, or only after Spanish contact. So you also you hear everybody that says, I've got a, a Cherokee grandmother. And I don't know if y'all have heard that, but I've heard it a lot. Like I've got my great grandmother's Cherokee Indian, a part Cherokee Indian. Cherokees were nowhere around here. Unless she was from like North Carolina or maybe far North Georgia, you didn't have a Cherokee grandmother. It's just kind of a something that's been perpetuated through the years. Um, but it's interesting because people really say it a lot. All right. <laughs> the early archaic period of Georgia, 10,000 to 8,000 years ago. So this is what you would have seen if you were there when the, many of these points were made. Bands of 20 to 50 people. 
you know, not permanent settlements, highly mobile, not a pleasant way to live. Um, they were, the megafauna is gone at this point, so they're, they're pretty much hunting the same things that you would see here today. But the lay of the land would have been different. Pine had not come on the scene. You had more hardwood forest because the land was cooler, I mean, the climate was cooler. Um, you have a lot um, of smaller bowl and bevel points. The big spear points decrease substantially because they're not hunting, you know, five ton mastodons anymore. They're hunting bear, deer, alligator, things of that nature. And you had no permanent settlements. And these are examples of bowl and bevel points, and you can see some of those up here too. Bowl and bevels, no, almost none of these were arrowheads, most of these were blades. The bow and bevel point flew on the end of a addle addle bolt, which was a bolt that had a mechanism that was harnessed flywheel effect. So when you slung it, that's what made that bolt fly. And it probably had darts that were replaceable. So the hunter would have a number of darts. He'd sling it, hit, reload, and go again. Um, it has a fine, very fine beveling to it. I don't know if that was to aid it to fly in the wind, but um, not an arrowhead. Arrows, bow and arrows were late woodland period. This is uh, probably 7,000 years before the bow and arrow would ever come on the scene. So that's another thing that people think a lot about is, uh, you know, bow and arrow, everything's an arrowhead. And that's an innocent thought, but I just want to make the point that the technology it took thousands of years to make small advances in technology. Middle to late archaic, that's 8,000 to 3,000 years ago. You have the design of these points change dramatically. The majority, um, again, were created during this, um, this period of time. You're still dealing with a lot of nomadic activity the human being is, is dependent on where the game is as opposed to what you will see soon, which is farming. And man begins to learn how to control his own environment. The woodland period. This was a big transitional period. The woodland period is 1000 BC to 700 AD. Time of transition where they've moved away from exclusively hunter and gathering until agriculture. They started to uh, piddle with some kinds of uh, grasses that would later become corn. Um, you had a lot more ceremonial things come about, like uh, objects, and uh, they had more free time because they were less, um, they were less a slave to having to move all the time. You got to sit by the campfire a little bit more because your food sources were a little more stable and therefore you have more leisure time. And so that makes good sense. This is a bowl, almost intact, that I've had redone, but that's probably a woodland period bowl. Those are fire marks where it was originally, you know, in a fire. It was crushed at some point, but that's almost the whole thing. And it is a big piece, it's that big. These are two more bowls. They're probably 18 inches across. This is probably woodland area work, uh, era work. This is actually the base and this is the top that would have been turned over on top of that. That was found washing out of the bank of the Savannah River. The original Monsanto were the American Indians. Um, this is what we had, they had uh, flint corn, not dent corn. It's very different from the kind of corn that you think about. It was this smaller, you know, more colorful type of corn. Um, and I think that it was probably imported from the Caribbean or somewhere further south. It disappeared, and this is pretty interesting, it disappeared from the record of between AD 400 and did not reappear until AD 900. And it was possibly because of a cooling period that corn has to have a certain amount of warm days during the year, it can't make it. So the corn that we have today though, its genesis began around AD 900. But the American Indian is who developed and who started to, to refine it. I'm going to skip through a lot of these because I, I know I need to keep it 
kind of brief and I got a few more slides that I want you to see. This is a killed cache. I believe that this was a group and you can see them over here. All of these have almost no edge wear. Uh, these came from a track in Burke County and I believe that they were all ceremonially broken and placed in a hole. Uh, a skitter blading off a deck where they were loading logs bladed into it and the skitter operator said, man, there's a bunch of, or somebody's been having an oyster roast up here. He said, there's oyster shells all over the place. And he said, and there's these rocks. And I said, let me bring them to me. And that was what it was. But if you look at them, note that there's, they're perfect. Somebody spent a lot of time and a lot of hours to make those and immediately destroy them. That's, the, that's another kind of point, another kind of broken base of point that were in another hole on the site. And then we have the mighty Mississippians. They're the mound builders. The 900, that's 900 BC to 1650 AD. Those are the mounds at uh, the Mulgee Monument. Agriculture, corn, squash, and beans. Corn, from a, nutritious, a nutrition standpoint, you can't get by on corn, but you put corn with, with squash and beans and you have enough uh, nutrients to, to get by and live pretty good. Um, you have a complex social order arrive here because of uh, more leisure time. Again, you're not traveling. You're at a mound center where the chief lives. You know, he literally, his house would have been right there. And they worshiped him. Oconee Valley, that's, I put that here just because that's where more of my time is spent, is Oconee Valley. This is a, a piece that came from uh, Cahokia, and that shows a very finely made chunky player. Um, they, in, the, in the Mississippian language, it was chunky, and then the Europeans sort of bastardized that and said chunky. They call them chunky stones. That's an example of some that I found. Those are some that are at the Old Mulgee Monument. That's a good example of one. The Mississippian pottery. It's paddle stamped, very fine and intricate detail. Those were made by carving a wooden paddle, stamping it into the wet, wet clay, and firing it. That's another, okay, this is Lamar, period. And if you compare this motif right here, you will see it right there. Those, if you find a you can go to any site in this area and you're going to see that same motif. And a lot of their designs had very important spiritual implications for them. This is the four directions. And they put a lot of emphasis in, in, the four, in the four directions, you know, where the sun rose and set and so forth. Um, these are more concentric circle designs. A concentric circle motif is very common in Mississippian pottery. This is a piece I bought. This is a, a Cadoan water bottle, but it shows you the symbolism. And I don't carry this one around because it's so rare, but the Cadoans were Mississippians. They were just further to the West. And that came from Arkansas. And this is a rattlesnake water bottle. And if you see there, those are the rattles. It's a very, very finely made piece. Inside is, is clay, smooth clay, and the outside was pig, they used a black pigment to make it look like that. That's another piece of Mississippian pottery. That's an in, intact bowl that I have. And this has this, this speaks to the, the theme of interconnectivity. And they believed in the interconnectivity of so many things, the, the weather, the seasons, the animals, the, um, you know, their belief system was, was governed by nature and what they saw. And so a lot of these, symbol, these symbolic things convey that. This was what their, their artifacts tell you about their world if you look at it closely. Now this is, this is a interesting piece and I'll, I'll bring this up. You know, this is a hot button topic. Graves, Indian burials, and I would never touch a grave. Uh, would never condone that being done, but my grandmother of all people found this in her backyard. And she was avid in, and I'm I say this to think about the way times have changed. This was found in 1963. And she was out there and she would took the children up on this bluff that now overlooks the Washington County uh, wastewater facility. And she would use a stone, a metal probe to find, she'd probe along these sand ridges to find uh, possible artifacts and then she would dig. 
with the children, and they had to go, they were going to church one morning, and they had been up there on the hill before church, and they hit something, and she said, we don't have enough time to dig, so let's go to church, and we'll come back. And they, they went to church, come back, had Sunday uh, lunch. She's cleaning up the dishes after Sunday lunch, and here comes my uncle running around the uh, corner of the house in 1963 with a human skull in his hand. And she runs out there and says, Ben, where'd you, where'd you get that from? And he went up there and said, we dug that hole. We dug where we found that, you know, we, we put the probe this morning. And so there were two people that were buried there. They were both in fetal position. She thought it might have been a murder. Like they thought somebody had been killed and buried up on the, on the hill. So they called the sheriff's office. They called the, uh, who called, they determined it wasn't a recent murder. And they called the University of Georgia, or the state hospital in Milledgeville at the time, worked these kinds of things. And they come to find out that it was a it was a Mississippian period burial, and they were facing each other. And the bowl, this is a Mississippian bowl here that was placed in between. It had particulate matter laying in the base of it when they found it, and it was a sacrifice. This person was killed, and you can I've got other pictures in a second. He was killed by an axe blow to the back of the cranium, and they were placed there to face each other for all time to come for reasons that I'll get to. That's the bowl. And these were pictures that were taken by UGA. It's Savannah complicated stamped pottery. And there is the cranium of the one who was killed. And you can see right here, that's the axe entry wound. If you can see this picture a little bit better, he, he was hit so hard that it shattered the cranial lines of his skull. And they theorized that he was made to kneel and the man stood over him, the, whoever, the warrior behind him came down on the back of his head with an axe. And, uh, and killed him. And they think it could have been either adultery or it could have been that he was a royal and if you, in their belief system, harnessing spirit power of another animal could help you get to the other realm. And they, if he was a royal subject or if the one that was killed was a royal subject, he could have been killed to help the higher ranking one make it across that spiritual, uh, into that next spiritual realm. And this is the letter, and I'll try to read it here, the, the pertinent parts, but this shows you how times have changed. This is from the state of Georgia in, on September 12, 1963, and I won't bore you with all the details, but imagine this being done today or said today. He first, he concludes, you know, he talks a little bit about this piece right here. These were found in the hole, and they think those were earplugs that were put in the one that was to be killed ear so that he could not hear the axe coming down and wouldn't wince or try to dodge it. He talks about that. He says, the little something that you found could be an earplug. Uh, I should have it examined more closely. Look for another when you sift that sand. And then he says, you should start your scrapbook on your excavation. The photos I sent will be a good beginning on, on illustrations. The fun comes in finding out everything you can about those people who lived in your backyard many years ago. The skull, as you know, is a remarkable specimen showing what I believe to be execution or sacrifice. And then he goes on to include a diagram of what it would have looked like when they killed him. And he says it was a diagram showing how this execution or sacrifice was carried out with a dull paddle of heavy wood. After digging up this area, you should place stakes in it at the excavated, uh, you should place stakes in it at the excavated burials in order to orient your future finds. So you go out and dig a, a, find an Indian burial today and tell the University of Georgia that, you know, suggest to them that you still want to dig at it and they'll tell you otherwise. Um, but that's not just how times have changed and they should have changed. You should never, and she was not, to be clear, she was not trying to do that. That's just the way it unfolded. They, that's the diagram of how they think it happened. So then you have the ceremonial uh, richness of the Mississippians. And this is my favorite part of Indian history. It's the latest, but it's also the, the most culturally complex the religion, the, the culture, the symbolism. This is the great bird man or the falcon dancer, and he was a deity. Uh, these were copper plates, and they're very complex. If you look at all of the components, this is a war club, and, it, and you think about projection of power. If I am a high chief and a powerful person, just like you know, the United States flag may be a projection of power or the coat of arms, you know, it, you want it to be uh, respectful, but to project who you are and how you deal with, you know, 
your people and your possibly your enemies. You have a war club. This is a double lobed arrow or an axe. This is the beheaded, a beheaded head of an enemy that he is dancing with, with the war club in the other hand. And um, he is dressed as the falcon dancer. And the falcon was a highly revered bird. And this was an anthropomorphic, or anthropomorphic, if I'm saying that right, uh, symbol where they dressed as part man, part animal. And this was very common. That's another example. This, this is the falcon dancer that was found at the Etowah site in Georgia. It's believed that it came from Cahokia, which is in Illinois, and transported to Georgia uh, from trade. And this is a different piece, but similar. There's a beheaded, there's the beheaded head, there's the war club. This is another example of it. This is a conch shell gorget. Uh, this is another Georgia piece. There's the beheaded head, there's the war club, and then this is the falcon, the, uh, the face print of the falcon. So that's another incarnation of the falcon dancer. And that's what it would look like if, if it were colorized. That's a piece they found on the track that's right across the creek that we bought. I think that's at the University of Georgia, but that's another incarnation of the falcon. They believe that that was the, piece, the centerpiece of a chief's headdress. And then we have Hernando de Soto. And I'm trying to, if I, am I going over five minutes or so? This is the last phase, the last gasp of the Mississippians. When, when Hernando arrives, everything changes. That's the last, from, from what we know from that point on will be written about as opposed to what you put together from an archeological site. And this was almost like a nuclear holocaust to Indian culture. De Soto's army had 600 fighting men, 250 to 300 horse mounted lancers, 300 slaves, you know, people think these, these explorers were a quaint little group of people that kind of wandered through the woods. This was the most powerful war force that had ever set foot on the continent at its time. It was absolutely lethal. These lancers could, if, if you were an Indian and you didn't immediately give up, they would line those horses up drop the lances and just ride and impale you, sling you off and keep going. And the horse was a game changer. I mean, the horse was the cavalry. They probably would have had a chance had it not been for the cavalry. They had war dogs with them, which is here. Um, these are Alanos or wolfhounds. They had uh, greyhounds, pit bulls, giant mastiffs. They had trail dogs and catch dogs, much like hog hunters use today. Trail dogs chased the Indians into a thicket, and once they were cornered, they, un they unleashed the catch dogs. The catch dogs were trained to disembowel, and they wore spiked collars. And you know, I like the University of Georgia, and like that, that, that collar with spikes, that's where it comes from. That collar was meant to stop the hands of an Indian that would try to choke that dog and stop him from being, stop the Indian from being disemboweled. If you grabbed it, it would go through your hands. I mean, you're talking ultimate brutality. This is a map of a French map, and I have this map, and it's French, but they had interestingly, interestingly put in a loose path of De Soto, and it's pretty accurate before its age. That's pre-colonial. It shows Ocute, which is for the, uh, the village where he crossed, um, which is on the Shinholster Mound site. It also shows the French River of May, which was the Altamaha. And if you follow the saga of Fort Caroline, they say it's in Florida. I believe it's actually just off I-95 um, at the Altamaha, and it's a triangular tabby foundation that's there. They put it in Florida because they said the, the St. John's was the River of May, but the French wrote that, the, that Fort Caroline was on the a, ri a river that flowed from the mountains to the ocean, and the St. John doesn't do that. And no joke, I can show you a better picture. The Altamaha, it says, R de May. <laughs> so, so 
Think about this. The Floridians might have a, a, a national monument in the wrong state. They literally have never found any, any archaeological evidence that it's there. All right, now here's the pretext for conquest and it's all good military campaigns that we've probably seen some in our lifetime. We need a good reason to go to war and it's religion a lot of times. And let me just read, that this, the writing of these people is excellent, but the, the flowery nature of it, this gives you a taste of it. Um, this is from... Garcilaso, no, let's see. This is Garcilaso de la Vega, known as El Inca. And I have this book if you would like to see it. It is for the glory and honor of the most holy trinity, God our Lord, and with a desire to augment his holy Catholic faith and the crown of Spain that we now attempt to record in these pages, the story of many cavalier Spaniards and Indians, and especially that of Hernando de Soto, Governor and Captain General of the provinces and seniorities, or seniorities of the great kingdom of Florida. Hernando de Soto participated in the first conquest of, of Peru and in the seizure of the despot Atahualpa, the bastard son who stole the Inca throne from its legitimate heir and was the last of his race to rule the empire. All right, part of that's true. Hernando de Soto was with uh, Hernan Cortez, um, I think. He was third in line behind the Inca, of the Inca conquest. He became fabulously rich, I mean, from Incan gold. And it's just interesting, men are all flawed, and that's why we should all go to church and ask to be better people, but he looted an entire culture, got rich off of it, and then you have this writing that he actually throws under the bus, this guy that he's long killed, and notes that he was down there involved with the, the seizure of this despot from South America. But the pretext is that he's there to spread religion. They were there for gold. They felt like that in North America there were riches here just as much as they had in South America where they had filled up galleon after galleon. And the tragedy of this expedition is they never found any gold. And they, they did horrible things to the Indians, tortured them, uh, raped them, burned their villages, uh, all in the name of conquest. And if you think about uh, irony and, and what, how what you do might come back to haunt you, this was about 1539. By 1542, 1539, De Soto is one of the richest men ever in the history of Spain. As of the date that this would have started to be written, he would be dead three years later. His body would be weighted and dropped into the Mississippi River because they did not want to see the, the Indians to see that he was not immortal, which he told people that he was and that he was an emissary of the sun god and to his name he had less than 10 pigs that is it and they think that he probably died of despondency and depression from complete and utter failure which if he would have just stopped and not gone on this expedition he would have been one of the wealthiest men in the world these are the four chroniclers i'd recommend if you're interested in that read them these are first-hand accounts of the men that were on the expedition three were De La Vega was, he wrote his part from debriefing the survivors. Um, and then finally, this is my last slide. I just felt like this is, well, second to last. This is something that you really should read if you are interested in it because of the odds of it ever happening. The first Spanish conquest was attempted by a guy named Navarrez, who was a brutal person. He was a torturer. He would cut the noses off of Indians trying to make them tell him where gold was that never existed. And there was a guy that was Spaniard with him, one of the conquistadors' name was Juan Ortiz, and he got captured. And they, they tortured him, and he was actually put on a barbecue spit in a frame and was partially cooked. And whenever one of the chief's daughters begged her father to not follow through and do it, they saved him. Years later, 
the Soto's men are attacking a town in northern Florida and the Lancers drop down the lances to, to run him through. And this is what they say. Juan Ortiz, Juan Ortiz, on the other hand, was attacked by Alvaro Nieto, a, a native of uh, Albuquerque, who was one of the strongest and most robust men in the entire Spanish army. Closing with the captive, this Spaniard thrust vigorously at him with his lance, but Juan Ortiz, Juan Ortiz possessed good fortune as well as skill for beating down the weapon with his bow, and at the same time, leaping aside, he was able to avoid both the lance and the encounter with the horse of his assailant. Then perceiving Alvaro Neito turning upon him again, he cried in a loud voice, ex vila, ex vila, by which he intended to say, Sevilla, Sevilla. The other account said that he says, Sirs, for the love of God and the Holy Mary, slay not me. I am a Christian like yourselves. I was born in Seville. My name is Juan Ortiz. Of all things, this guy was saved by the, the Soto expedition after having lived in Florida among the Indians for 10 years at the last second before he was run through with a lance had the presence of mind to say Seville, and he lifted the lance. He became a vital member of the expedition as a translator. And finally, that is the seven layer bead. If you ever find one of these, you need to call me. That's the calling card of DeSoto. These, these have been found at the Telfair County site called the Glass site. They've been found in Augusta, and I think that eventually, I hope I will find one at the site that we have in uh, Baldwin County, but that's at a Venetian trade bead. It is the, it's a seven layer chevron. That is the only bead that, the, that was carried only by the DeSoto expedition. So I have taken too much time and I appreciate y'all having me. I will take any questions if you want um, and I'll hang around afterwards. I'll have to blind, I think, I don't know if this is still on. I'll have to blindfold you, but you can come. Okay. <laughs> Let me tell you one thing that he does do, and I found this out from stalking him on Facebook. He takes out a group of young people, children, in either from Lawrence County or from Wrightsville, on an annual expedition. They spend the night in tents, and they find Clovis points. Or Not points. Clovis. They don't find, well, they yeah. don't find Joseph, help me. If you, if you are interested and you have children, the reason that I do that is the reason that I gave you when I first started talking to pass that interest along to future generations. I feel like this is a dying interest. I, I know y'all have done a mural here of American Indian history in Statesboro. I think that's wonderful. It's an underappreciated part of history that's never gotten the credit that it deserves. And unless you get children out there and get their hands dirty and mud on their feet, in an age of, of devices and screens, it is at risk of being lost. So if you are interested, as she said, you can find me on Facebook. I will be glad to accept a friend request and I'll put it out there when we're gonna do it. We have to take maybe 10 to 15 at a time, but we do some digs on this site on Town Creek that was the village site it's probably been, the, the ground has probably been disturbed way long ago by farming activities, so we're not digging in anything that's untouched, but I guarantee you they'll find all the pottery in the world and maybe a Clovis Point. And supposedly they abandoned a cannon at that site, and that's what I really want to find. Um, I have a question, Joseph. When we wanted to honor our indigenous natives, did we have to find the Clovis Point? And we did by putting a $30,000 mural on uh, a building that the Avery Center owns. Uh, we select, for obvious reasons, the archaic period, the, 
the late RJ. I have had numerous people, seriously, numerous people in Bullock County say, well, Kenny, why didn't you do the Creek Indians? You know, they lived here. And my grandmama was a Cherokee, so you know, I get it too. We give, I'm obviously a CPA and some other things, but I'm not an archaeologist. Will you explain to this group why we chose the archaic period? Well, the archaic this period. Is the pro the archaic period was, can everybody hear me okay? Can you, you turn my microphone? Come up here, the uh, archaic period, is that better? The archaic period is, again, the, the period in time when most of these stone points were made, the lasting artifacts. You know, we don't have the organic artifacts like shoes and clothes and stuff. They didn't make it. So I think that as far as the art, the artistry, which I think this is, all these points are, um, I mean, they're utilitarian pieces, but they're, they're works of art. Um, that's the period when all these things were, were made. Um, if you want to talk about point production, it went down pretty precipitously after that period from the early ar ar uh, archaic to the late archaic, I mean, uh, yeah, late, ar late archaic. The creeks, and I've skipped along a lot in my talk because I'm trying to keep keep it time down, but the, the, the fallout from Spanish communicable diseases after 1540 was again almost like a nuclear holocaust the the numbers are from 75 percent to 95 percent mortality and think about that you know if there's a hundred people in a room within years two years from now five of us will be left think about how much how much oral history is lost by that that death rate and of course they didn't understand it they had they they had no immunities to it and they didn't understand why they were dying out so quickly and and the creeks were just the almost like like war refugees that that were survivors for whatever reason that banded back together in these small bands they were called creeks because when the europeans really started to make their way into the interior they found them living near creeks and there's no one group that's the creek indians they're just the it's called the creek confederacy and they're bands from you know all over the place all over georgia but there really is no such thing as a creek tribe in my opinion and one of the saddest things about it is at this mound site, the Schenholster mound site, as well as many others, when the English found these people at the Schenholster site, they were living away from the mound site by about 100, maybe 100 yards, I think. It was grown up, and the English asked, what are these earthworks? And they told them that they were the work of a long ago uh, ancient people that thousands of years had come across the Mississippi River, built them and had disappeared somewhere. When in fact, it was probably, at least partially, uh, contributed to by their own grandparents. So many of them died that they could no longer explain why these massive mounds that were right behind them had been built. You know, could you imagine with your own family that level of decimation? So that is all the, of the historic period, though, and that's not really, I think, the, the era you're trying to uh, preserve here. There's value in it, but if you want to talk about the Native Americans of Georgia, you're talking about Clovis, Archaic, Woodland, Mississippi, and, and there it ends. So, y'all got it? Um, it? It's wonderful. Also, those talking about we have ordered a bronze plaque, much like the small bronze plaques we put downtown. This is a big bronze plaque. It will come in this week. And uh, it, it, I urge you to go down and it will describe to you in detail what those images, the five images on the mural represent from the archaic period 5,000 years ago. I don't know when we've had a more invigorating, professional, fun, Program. And we got some just fabulous prizes.
I don't know about pro Thanks. professional now. Thanks. Uh, that would be nice. Oh okay, yeah, I've got a whole jar of those beads. This is, this is a gorgeous. This is a Bullet County Historical Society mug, and I want you to put your painting uh, All right. brushes in there. You may even keep a nice bag. Well, thank you. And we have had two nice publications in the Clock Tower series. Our first one was Out of the Past, which was the writings of Maud Brandon Edge, who was the daughter of the first mayor of Sandsville. Thank you. And this is our bestseller book, and we never could come up with a title that's more poignant than what it was, The Hodges Family Murders and the Lynching of Paul Reed and Will Cato. Sad history, but true. Wonderful. To have a well, again, thank you all for having me, and I'll, I'll stay around too if you have any questions and talk as long uh, as you want. He also brought up cases of these gorgeous artifacts. I asked Joseph, how much do you have those in June for? So, you know, some of us don't do that, but anyway, he went to a lot of trouble, so please come up. I want to remind you that in June will be the annual meeting. We have decided to do it at lunch because we have a better crowd where I'll get up and don't like to drive at night. And the program is on Birds of Georgia and how that began and the Audubon collection with my grandmother's next door neighbor on Savannah Avenue, Dr. R.J.H. DeLoach. And Dr. R.J.H. DeLoach was a vagabond. He traveled with Henry Ford, Thomas Edison, John Muir, and the like. So this is a program, this is another Joseph Sumner program you don't want to miss. So please make your reservations on time so we can get a good number for Annette. I see Annette. Thank you for that delicious roast beef, Sean. And thank you for supporting our Historical Society and your Society. Thank you very much.